Hi, everybody. Welcome to session 2.2. We're continuing our discussion of federal tax law. We're talking specifically about charitable entities today. You remember in the last class session, class session we learned about 501c3, c4s, and c6s. Today, we're going to focus just on the c3 category, which is charities. Okay, um, from this class session, I want you to be able to explain how the personal income taxes work and charitable deductions. I want you to explain why charitable donations are not what's called a normal good. It's an economics term. And then articulate why the charitable tax deduction is an economically inferior policy. I want you to be able to explain the elements of the organizational and operational tests. And then there are four different kinds of charities or C3 entities. And I need you to know the differences between each of the four. Okay, so let's talk about charitable tax deductions and how they work financially. The way personal income taxes work is all of your income by default is taxable. If you found buried treasure in your backyard, you would have to pay an income tax on it. And so uh, so this is the default presumption. You'll notice this is different than with companies. With companies, they have they only get taxed on their profits, which is revenue minus expenses. Americans get taxed on their income and the baseline income that's taxes all of it. But you can make deductions, but they... Are, tend to be limited. And so these deductions are the ways you remove in, income from the category of taxable income to non-taxable income. And so when you make that change, when you move income from the taxable category to the non-taxable category, that makes it a deduction. And uh, donations to charity are deductible, for example. So is uh, local income taxes that you pay. So is... Um, uh, interest on a mortgage. Um, these are examples of deductible expenses um, that can reduce your income uh, that will be facing a, the federal income tax. It's important that we understand the effect of deductions because it's going to play into the way we understand how the charitable deduction actually changes behavior. Um, spoiler alert, the answer is actually not that much. Um, theoretically, it should work something like this. I mean, if you buy a candy bar, this is how much you actually pay. You pay a dollar for the candy bar at the store, plus a sales tax if there's a sales tax. Let's pretend that's not the case here. Um, so if you're buying this candy bar in Montana, you pay a dollar for the candy bar. But because you're spending that dollar in a way that's not deductible from your taxes, that means you're also paying an income tax on the dollar you use to buy the candy bar. And so the candy bar actually costs you $1.15 if, if your marginal income tax rate is 15%. And so, so you don't see that f extra $0.15 cents at the register, but you pay it later in your, in your 1040 when you file your taxes. And that's because you chose to spend the dollar on a candy bar. If you choose to give the dollar to charity instead, then it's just a dollar. When your income taxes roll around, you tell the IRS, hey, I spent this dollar on charity. You deduct it from your income taxes, and you deduct it from your income, which then lowers the amount of tax that you're going to pay. So the the candy bar or any other non-deductible purchases are more expensive by the amount of whatever your marginal income tax rate is. And so in this sense, and this is a really important principle, giving to charity is cheaper than buying the candy bar. Cheaper in the sense that they both cost a dollar at the register, so to speak, but there's a hidden extra tax that comes from buying the candy bar that you don't have to pay when you buy the donation. And so what that essentially means is that deductible expenses are cheaper than, uh, than taxable ones. So, um, so this is the first point I want to make. The reason deductible expenses are cheaper is because you don't owe a tax on it later when you file your 1040. Um, the way deductions work in the U.S., um, you can deduct in, you can deduct things from your taxes in two ways. You can itemize your deductions, which means you add up all your deductible expenses during the year, all your donations to charity, the mortgage you paid on your interest, the local taxes that you paid. You add all those up, and then you tell the IRS, hey, take this out of my income when you tax me. So you don't pay a tax on those things. Um, but the other option is to take what's called the standard deduction, which is what most Americans do. Um, they take the standard deduction, which is sort of the way for the IRS to say, hey, don't worry about itemizing. 
just claim this number as your standard, as your deduction, and then we'll reduce your income, your taxable income by that amount. If you take the standard deduction, the value of all your itemized deductions go away. And what that means is the interest that you pay on your mortgage, it doesn't have a tax benefit to you anymore. The money that you gave to charity doesn't have a tax benefit anymore because you can only take either the standard deduction or itemize your deductions. You can't do both. And because you can't do both, if you take the standard deduction, all those itemized expenses that could be deducted from your income, those disappear. Now that's going to be important too for a reason we're going to talk about in a minute. The last thing I want to say about deductions that is important is it's important to understand that they're always limited in time, generally meaning that you have to you have to claim the deduction in the year that you spent the money that way. I can't claim a charitable deduction for a donation that I gave to you know uh, the church. 20 years ago. Too much time has passed. I have to claim that donation in the year in which I made it. I can't go backwards and claim it later. Um, but uh, there are also limited in size deductions are, which means that I can only, usually it's as a proportion of income, which means that, for example, if I gave, if I made a million dollars and I gave all of it to charity, the most I could deduct from my taxes is 50%. So, um, so I'd still pay taxes on that half million, even though I gave it to charity. And um, we're going to talk about how the IRS does the math on that at the end of this class session. So knowing these things, we're going to ask this question. Is our current tax policy efficient in encouraging donations? The idea is, because donations are cheaper than candy bars as far as taxes are concerned, hopefully that means we're incentivizing more donations and and, they, and so we give a deduction because we want people to give to charity and we're trying to incentivize them to give to charity by making donations cheaper by not charging a tax on the donations. And so the question is, and so what, the, what this means is that the federal government is giving up lots of tax revenue, uh, tens of billions of it actually. The federal government is giving away lots of tax revenue in exchange for encouraging people to donate to charity. And the question is, are we doing that efficiently? Well, one of the ways we one of the questions we need to ask is how effective is this incentive? Does changing the tax rate on donations actually induce people to give more to charity? Well, there's been research on this. I'm going to talk about some of the research, but I want to paint a bigger picture first to show you that don't, the charitable deduction probably doesn't influence behavior all that much. This rate, this chart shows you the change in tax rates faced by people in the United States, depending on income. And so at the bottom, you see the lowest earning 20% of the bottom quintile. You can see that their effective tax rate, the total amount of taxes that they pay over the course of the, you know, on a, on a year's worth of income tends to hover around 16 to 17%. As you work your way up the chain, you see how the effective tax rate gets higher. Well, if you go all the way up to the very, very top, where you see the 0.01 percenters, the people who are the, you know, the multi multi-millionaires, um, you can see that their effective, their effective tax rates changed quite a bit, where in the 60s it was as much as 70%, meaning every new dollar that they earned, they paid 70 cents of it as an income tax. Well, come Reagan, those rates dropped dramatically, and so you can see that carrying it forward to 2004, and now it's actually even lower, the effective rates for, um, for the wealthiest Americans tend to hover around 30-ish percent. And so it's changed a lot. The reason this matters is because those highest, those 0.01 percenters and the one percenters give the most to charity. In fact, they give more to charity than everybody else combined. And so if we change these tax rates, what we should see is a change in giving. Now, this may not seem intuitive, but if you lower tax rates on everything else, the effect is making donations relatively more expensive because where before... Um, the candy bar in 1960 would have cost that person a dollar seventy. Now the candy bar only costs them a dollar thirty, and and that means that that donations are relatively more expensive because the price has dropped on candy bars in in terms of the the effective tax rate. So by raising the cost of donations, we should have seen and and the fact on by raising the cost of donations for the wealthiest Americans. 
we should have seen a drop in donations from them. And because they give more to charity than everybody else combined, we would have expected to see a drop in the overall level of giving, which, as we've talked about before in class, hasn't really happened. And so this chart shows donations as a share of economic productivity in the United States. As we've talked about before, it tends to hover around 2%. And as you can see, it hasn't really changed during that same time period. You didn't see a substantial drop in giving because probably the answer is that the tax rate um, and the charitable deduction that goes with it probably does not influence giving nearly as much as people think. Let me describe a few uh, implications of this. I want to talk for a minute about normal goods. A normal good is something that you buy more of as your income goes up. So if you make more money, you buy more of this of, of this thing, that makes it a normal good. Uh, you buy bigger houses, fancier cars, more clothing, those are all normal goods. Well, donations are also normal goods in this sense. <clears throat> that is to say that donations incre tend to increase as people make more money. Another way to describe that is that they're income elastic, meaning they respond well to changes in income, donations do. So donations go up as income goes up. And so, so far, donations look like a normal good. But another thing about normal goods is you buy more of them as the price goes down. Um, you know, if, uh, if a really fancy car costs half as much, you'd have a lot more people buying that fancy car. The uh, same is true of homes, electronics, whatever. These are all normal goods because price going down is sort of like your income goes up for that thing. Um, It'd be like me, you know, giving you gift certificates to go buy these houses and electronics and clothing and whatever. Um, and so that's what that's the same effect as the price going down. Well, a normal good, if the price goes down, you buy more of it. But that's not true for donations. This is the weird part. The, the price of donations going down or up doesn't change the behavior. So that means demand for donations is price inelastic, meaning that demand for donations doesn't respond to changes in price. And this is weird. And in fact, you're not going to find any other good like this. I challenge you. In fact, I challenge my students every year to find a good where you buy more of it as your income goes up, but you don't buy more of it as the price goes down. Because that's what's true for donations. In fact, there's been other research to show this price inelasticity. And there's a paper put out by Indiana University that found that the price elasticity of donations was about negative 0.2. <clears throat> which we'll talk about this in class. That's a very low number. That's, it shows a lot of inelastic, uh, inelasticity relative to price. But it's not just relative to tax rates. It, it, this price inelasticity shows up in other things too. Um, for example, one paper showed that the changing of tax rates didn't actually change long-term giving, just short-term giving. But then in another really fascinating study done by uh, two of my favorite economists. I hope you all have favorite economists. This paper was by Dean Carlin, who's at uh, Yale right now, I think, and John List, who's at Chicago. Um, they did this really cool study where they had a charity send out a group of mailers where there was a one-to-one -one match, a two-to-one match, and a three-to-one match being offered to the donors. And then there's a fourth group who wasn't offered a match at all. Well, the existence of a match made donors more likely to give, but the size of the match didn't affect them. So a one-to-one -one match had the same incentive on giving that a three-to-one match had. And that's like saying, you know, if you're selling, if the grocery store is selling your favorite cereal, you're going to buy just as much with a buy one, get one free as you are to a buy one, get three free. But that's obviously not true. You'd get way more cereal with a buy one, get three free deal. But that doesn't work that way with donations because demand for donations is price inelastic. Part of the reason this is true, we're going to talk about this in class, is because the price of donations is usually hidden. Like the real true economic price, like the price that affects you in the long run for your donations, is hidden from you. So therefore you don't have a way to be responsive to it. The long and short of this is that this means that charitable donations are not a normal good. Um, they respond to changes in income, but they don't respond to changes in price, and that's weird. So like I said, I challenge my, my students every year to come up with an example of some other good where that's true. And I have yet to have a student do that, but uh, maybe you'll be the one. Okay. So what this means is if we're incentivizing giving through, donate, through charitable deductions, well, we're giving, what it means is we're letting people off the hook on a lot of tax revenue, incentivizing very little change. We're not actually incentivizing donors to 
to give because they would be giving anyway and they would be paying taxes. Now, I realize if you're opposed to taxes, you're just fine with that arrangement. But if you're the federal government, this is a dumb policy. It's dumb because it's ineffective in incentivizing giving. It's essentially overpaying for an outcome. The federal government is way overpaying for the amount of charitable giving that they're that they're inducing. But there are more problems than that. It's not just that it's wasteful to the federal government to give away all this tax revenue in exchange for very little changes and very small changes in behavior. But the other problem is that it's it's a regressive tax policy, which means that it benefits wealthy people more than poor people. And let me show you the effect of this. So here we've got three donors. A low income person is the first one who doesn't itemize their taxes. They just use the standard deduction. We have a middle income, middle to upper income person who pays a 15% tax rate, a marginal tax rate, and they itemize their taxes. And then you have a very wealthy donor who's paying the top rate of 32% and they also itemize their taxes. Well, this is what happens. If all three of them give the exact same dollar donation, meaning they all give $10,000, so, so the donated, donated amount is equal across all three of these people, the benefit to all three of them is very different. The, the low-income non-itemizer doesn't get any tax benefit for their donation. The middle-income itemizer gets $1,500 back from the IRS in exchange for this $10,000 donation. They basically get a subsidy equal to $1,500, even though they gave the same amount as the first person. And the rich person gets $3,200 back for the same $10,000 donation. This isn't a relative difference. This is where we're not talking about one giving more than the other. They're all giving the same amount, and yet the tax benefit to all three is very different. And the richer you are, the more generous the tax code is to you, even if you give the same amount as everybody else. And that's not a policy we want to reinforce. At the very least, it should be equal. It shouldn't, but it definitely shouldn't be leaning toward benefiting wealthy people more than everyone else. But there are other problems with it. Because of the way marginal tax rates and the standard deduction work, we have this first problem that donations of the wealthy are subsidized more than donations by the poor. But there's more to it than that. If you have a mortgage, you're more likely to itemize, and that means that donations of homeowners are subsidized more often than the donations of renters. And I don't know why we should care. Why should we care whether or not you're a homeowner or renter when it comes to giving? And yet the tax code, because of the way this falls out, the tax code looks at you and says, oh, are you a homeowner? Hmm, well, we really want you to give, but if you're a renter, we don't care. I mean, that's obviously not deliberate. It's not what Congress set out to do, but it's the effect of, what's, of what they've done. And also, if you live in a city with high taxes, that also makes you more likely to itemize, and that means the donations of people in high-tax cities are subsidized more than those in low-tax cities. Or put another way, the donations of urban dwellers are subsidized more than the donations of rural people. And why should we care, right? We should treat all those donations equally, but the tax code doesn't have that actual effect. There are a lot of alternatives that people have considered. This is one of my favorites, and this is replacing the deduction with a credit. And so the way this works is it actually turns into a direct tax credit rather than a dedu deduction from your income. The effect of that is to make it more obvious to people what happens with their donations. It also makes the benefit income independent, meaning that it doesn't matter what your income is. You're going to get the same percentage discount on your taxes for your donation as everybody else. This particular model lays out a, a, a one that was scored by the Congressional Budget Office, where essentially it says, for every dollar you give, we're going to give you 15% back of the value of that dollar in a tax credit, um, but only if you give above 2% of your income. So the first 2% of your income, if you donate that much, we're not going to give you any tax breaks. And the reason we do that is because historically we've been at that number anyway. But if you give more than 10%, like let's say you're a tithe payer, then that amount above, so you're a tithe payer meaning you pay 10% of your income, well, 8% of that donation is going to, the 2% we're not going to give you a benefit on, but the 8% we are, and we're going to calculate it at 15% of where that value is. And this essentially shows you the outcomes. It shows how much each of these people gives and the tax credit that results from it. And what's cool about this is the Congressional Budget Office scored this and found that it would very, produce very little change in charitable giving, but it would increase 
federal tax revenue by tens of billions of dollars, which, you know, could be hopefully put to good use, but I guess that's another question. Okay, so this is why the tax co the tax deduction is an economically inferior policy. I should have said that this class session is the longest and most complex one, and I apologize for that. I know we're already at 20 minutes, but we still have a little ways to go. Okay, now we're going to switch to tax code um, policy, not policy stuff, but just sort of the day-to-day -day realities for charities. And we're going to talk about what it takes to be a 501c3. If you want to qualify as a 501c3, meaning you want the IRS to give you that status, then you have to pass two tests. And these are the organizational tests and the operational tests. I'm going to describe them quickly. The organizational test is basically going to look at your properly executed, legally enforceable organizational documents. Now, if you read that, you think, boy, I think I know what those are. And then you go, wait a minute, those are the articles of incorporation and the bylaws. Then you would be right because that's what they are. So they're going to look at your articles and bylaws and they're going to look to see if you have certain elements included in those. This is this, Essentially what this means is if you take the exact language that the IRS says you're supposed to include in your articles of incorporation, then you automatically pass this test. This test is passed by copying and pasting. And in fact, I put in here, in each of these cases, I put in the exact text that you could put into your articles. And if you include this word for word into your articles, then you will pass the, each of these each element of this test. So here, for example, there's a dissolution clause element that you have to have, which says that if your nonprofit ever dissolves, you'll take any of the remaining assets and give them to another nonprofit or to the federal government. And that makes sense because we don't pe want people starting scam nonprofits, dissolving them, and then keeping the money. Here we have something called the inurement clause. We're going to talk about inurement in the next class session, but essentially you have to promise that you're not going to give the assets to anybody in a way that's similar to ownership. Here we have the purpose clause, and this is where you say you'll limit your activities just to charitable purposes. If you remember, I told you in the articles of incorporation discussion that you want to make sure you have your articles have a very broad statement about your purpose. You don't want to be narrow and specific and say, oh, we only help kids in Utah County. Because your organization might grow and outgrow that, that purpose, but your articles of incorporation would limit you based on your purpose statement. So you keep it broad, but the IRS says it can't be whatever. You, you have to at least operate within the confines of 501c3 status, and that's what this purpose clause does. And then finally, you have to have a political activity clause. You remember from the last class session that charities can, can only engage in insubstantial lobbying and zero political activity, and this is just a statement in your articles that says that you will follow those requirements. Now, the IRS imposes these requirements in your articles because they want to have legal effect against your organization. They want It gives the IRS more teeth to force you to behave a certain way. The operational test is the other test, and this one is not based on your documents. It's based on your behavior, and there are three key elements that the IRS will look for. The first is they'll make sure you're operating for a charitable class, and this is a concept we already discussed when we talked about charitable trusts. You remember one of the beneficiaries of a trust can be the charitable class, and I represent it with a little cloud. It has all the same attributes here, so it has to be an indefinite group of people, meaning that people can move in and out of the class, and the activity that's benefiting them has to be considered charitable under the tax code. So it would be the difference between naming some specific classmates as the beneficiaries of your charity versus naming BYU students more generally. Um, and so this is why charities, for example, can't receive a donation to, that's directed toward a specific person because once they do that, that means they're not operating for a charitable class. They're operating at least in part for that one specific person that the donor named, and that's why that's not allowed. You also have to pass the commensurate test element, which is essentially saying that you have to spend your money the way a charity should be spending their money. I know that sounds really vague, but it is vague. The way the IRS doesn't give a mathematical test for this rule, they don't say spend at least this much of your money on programs. But generally, they're going to look at your total income, and then they're going to look at how you spend it toward charitable purposes. For example, if you spent all your money on fundraising activities, then that would probably violate the commensurate test. The IRS likes this being a loosely defined test because it gives them the freedom to go after bad people without it, them sort of towing the exact line that maybe could otherwise be defined. Um, the commensurate test was um, part of what came up in the Ensign Peak issue that was in the news um, about the church and its investment arm. And we can talk about that in class. 
And then finally, you can't be engaged in business activities that are unrelated to your charitable purpose. Now, charities, like we talked about already, they earn a lot of income. They sell a lot of goods and services. But the, but, the, but the goods and services that you sell have to be furthering a charitable purpose of some kind. Selling health care is a charitable purpose. Selling gasoline at a gas station is not. Now, you're allowed to earn a little bit of unrelated business income, meaning if you're carrying out an activity that's not related, but it's not a huge part of what you do, you're, you can get away with that. But if it becomes substantial relative to everything you do, then then it's a problem and the IRS will get mad and remove your exempt status. If you, as long as you keep that business unrelated business income insubstantial, then what that means is the IRS will make you pay an income tax on just that income. So a really common way that charities deal with this is by selling advertising. If you have a newsletter and you sell ad space, that's not related to a charitable purpose and or that's not furthering a charitable purpose and so they're not, they're not going to, so the IRS is going to tax you on your profits from selling that ad space. But if it becomes all you do is selling ad space, then the IRS will remove your exempt status. Um, and it's important to remember, it's not, what, what, what makes it charitable is not how you spend the money that you get from that activity. It's how you earn it. Earning it has to be furthering a charitable purpose. Okay. So, now we're going to wrap up with a few more things. We need to talk about the four different kinds of 501c3 entities. So if you're a charity, you're going to be one of these four kinds of charities. The first one and default one is private foundation status. This is what you are if you can't prove that you should be something else like a public charity, for example. Now, private foundation, public charity, these are words like the word private versus public. Those They have meanings outside of the tax code. But in this specific context, the words go together, private foundation and public charity, and they are specific technical terms within the tax code. Um, so anyway, private foundation is what you are if you can't be something else as a charity. And being a private foundation is not great. And it's something that most people would prefer to not have. And we'll talk about why. Generally, these are the charitable vehicles for families and companies. So like a family has a bunch of money that they want to give away, they might create a foundation and then make a large donation to the foundation. Then the foundation gives that money away to other charities. Corporations do this sort of thing too. And like I said, this is the least favorable status. Um, and the reason is because, well, there are lots of reasons. One of them, for example, is that if you're a private foundation, the law requires you to give away at least 5% of your assets every year. If you don't, you're going to pay a penalty equal to 5% of your assets. And so you're going to give away, you're going to lose 5% of, of all you own every year as a private foundation, no matter what. And it's either giving it out to other charities or it's giving it to the federal government as a penalty tax. I'm going to be building in this table to kind of illustrate the differences. That first column about contributions, don't worry about it. I will explain it at the end of this class session and then, and then in class together. But if you're a private foundation in that second column, you'll see that if you spend your money, you have to do it in a documented way with contracts binding it all for a charitable purpose. This is a pretty high standard that regular, that other charities don't, don't other 501c3s don't have to deal with. You're actually not free of paying a tax. You have to pay a 2% investment income tax. And when it comes to that annulment thing about making sure people don't benefit in non-charitable ways, the foundations get a higher level of scrutiny called self-dealing, which we're going to talk about in the next class session. So the best status to have is being a public charity. And the way you become a public charity is you either are what's called an inherently public activity so if you're a church, a school, a university, a hospital, or a government, you automatically get public charity status. But if you're not one of these, you can still get this public stat, public charity status by, by demonstrating what's called broad public support, which means that one-third of all of your income each year comes from the general public. And the IRS uses a mathematical test for this, and I'm not going to make you learn it, but the basic idea is if you want to be a public charity, you can't rely on just a small handful of donors like a foundation does. Instead, you have to rely on the general public. That creates a vetting process that says you're maybe more trustworthy because lots of people give you money. And if lots of people give you money, we're going to be a little more loose with you. You can also get around the one-third test with a, something else called the facts and circumstances test, but it's harder to pass. So pulling up our chart, again, remember to ignore that first column because I'll explain it in a minute. 
what you can see is, is as far as expenditures go, you just have to operate for a charitable purpose. You don't have to keep make it all documented. You don't have to con bind every expense to a contract. Like that's an easier way to operate. You don't pay any income tax, excise taxes. And the way we scrutinize your behavior is at a lower threshold called private benefit, which again, we'll talk about in, in session 2.3. So there are two other categories I want to talk about, and these are kind of blended categories. One of them is private operating foundation status, and this is just a private foundation that instead of giving money away, is carrying out the charitable activity itself. So it's like a public charity with a small group of donors. And so it's still going to be treated like a private foundation in some ways, but it's going to be treated like a public charity in other ways. So it's sort of a blend between public charities and private foundations. And then the other status is a supporting organization status. And this is going to be a, an entity that has a small group of, of donors, but the organization commits itself legally to only helping public charities. And so if it commits itself saying we are going to operate just in a way that supports public charities, then the IRS will sort of flow through the benefits of being a public charity down to the supporting organization. So adding these two in, again, ignore the first column for now. You can see that as far as expenditures go, if you're a private operating foundation, you have to spend at least 3% of your assets. That's better than giving away 5%, but you still pay the investment income tax and you have the higher self-dealing rules. But if you look at the supporting organization, it looks like a public charity in every way, except under the expenditures column, you see that the charity has, the supporting organization has to make sure all of its activities go toward the support of the public charity or charities that they've chosen. So let's get into that last slide and we'll answer these questions together in class. Okay. I said this at the beginning, but I want to reiterate it now. If you give all your income to charity in a single year, that doesn't mean you can deduct it all from your taxes. We're going to cap the, um, the deductibility of your donation depending on a combination of factors. And this table shows you what that combination of factors is. And so the first thing the IRS is going to look at is, are you giving cash or are you giving other property like, like real estate, jewelry, paintings, whatever. If you're giving cash, then this is how it gets treated. Cash that goes to a private foundation means you can deduct up to 30% of your income. So we're going to cap out your donate the deduction for your donation at 30% of your income if you gave cash to a private foundation. If you give to any of the other three kinds, public charity, supporting organization, private operating foundation, then a cash donation that's big means you can deduct up to half of your income for the year. That means if you had a million dollars and you gave a million dollars, but you gave the million dollars to the public charity, you could deduct a half a million from your taxes. Um, now, if you give other property, we're going to limit you to 20% of your income for a private foundation and 30% of your income for these other types. But the other thing we're going to do is we're going to limit you to either your basis or the fair market value. Now, fair market value is what the thing is worth. Your basis is what you paid for it. And so if you give property, like let's say you give real estate to a private foundation, you're going to be stuck at 20% of your income, but you're also going to be stuck at whatever it is you paid for it. And that's a bad thing. We'll lay it out in class, but that's a big problem because it means that you may end up sacrificing a whole bunch of value that has built up in this thing over time above what you paid for it. If you gave it to the other entities, you'd be able to capture that value in your tax deduction, but that's not true for a private foundation. Now, if this feels confusing to you, don't stress out because we're going to practice this together in class. And in fact, I have a little problem set up that we're going to work through together where I have my income for the year is $100,000. I have $50,000 in cash I give to one of the two columns. And then I have a painting that I can give to one of the two columns. And in class together, we're going to work out what I can deduct from my taxes depending on the combination of these elements. Sorry for this class session being long. This was the longest and most technical of all the class sessions for the whole semester. So you, you are over the hump on this and uh, everything else from here is going to be easier. <laughs> anyway. All right. We'll see you all in class.